ran the London Marathon and I crossed the line and I was like, yes, you take your pit pony legs. And, you know, and here I am at 40 running the London Marathon. But I didn't know at the time that the side effects of running long distances had cured me from epilepsy. And it's one of those crazy medical things that uh, is just a phen you know, phenomenal for me. And it was, and I didn't then after five years, I had, um, I had uh, the, the letter that said, you're cured, you've cured yourself of epilepsy. Hi, and welcome to The Good Chat, where we interview activists, entrepreneurs, personalities, and anyone who, ex who has experiences and insights that empower and inspire. Today's guest is Trudy Kerr. Thank you for being here, Trudy. Thank you for having me. Um, before we start, I'd just like to thank uh, Tech.mt, People and Skin, and Gracie's, where we're actually hosting this podcast. Trudy, thank you so, so, so much for being here. Um, I'm excited to interview you because I believe possibly you're not interviewed very often. No, I've never been interviewed. So I, I worked out before I came to see you, I've probably done about a thousand interviews, but I myself have never been interviewed. So I'm kind of nervous and... Oh, me shaking. too. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> My first question is, I, I saw you on a panel, I attended a SHE event, and you, you kind of took us through your story, which I don't think many people know, and I'd love to share, kind of be able to share your story as well with our audience. Uh, I believe you moved to Malta a few years ago, but you had a very different life in the UK. Can you maybe tell us something about it? Well, um, in the UK, I, I, I mean, I was born in 1974, so I'm, I'm an old timer. And I spent most of my life in the UK. I moved to Malta 17 years ago uh, with a man and a boat. Um, and I got here and fell in love with Malta, fell out of love with the man and the boat, and they both left. And I decided to make this my life. And I had been through a whole series of uh, experiences in the UK, not all positive. And so for me to come here and be able to start afresh and to start anew and to build a new journey for myself was absolutely amazing. Uh, and that's really been a legacy of my time in Malta. It's a just fresh start. You know, I see people in the UK and they're like, oh my word, what happened? Where did you go? You know, so this is my life here and, and this is where I'm settled. So what were the challenges that you possibly faced before moving to Malta when you say your life was different? Ooh. I'm trying to remember what I told you before. I'm like, what did I say? <laughs> well, I, I, before I left London, I had been married and in a very painful and difficult marriage. I was only married for three years, but there was a lot of, of pain that came out of that marriage. He was an obsessive compulsive with the most horrible and vile behavior. And, and I ended up being um, assaulted by his boss and all these sorts of things. And it sent, it sent me on a mental health spiral downwards um, to, to the extent of self-harming, to the extent of alcohol, drug abuse, all sorts of things. And at a point where I really thought that was the end. And I thought, I have nothing left to give. And I certainly have nothing to receive. And I just had one of those moments sitting on the edge of a, edge of a, a windowsill where I was ready to say goodbye and finish everything. And I had an epiphany moment. I was spoken to, I, was, I had an experience and, and decided from that point on I was going to start again. And that's what I did. And then coming to Malta was part of that journey. But that's a whole nother long story. But then that gave me a different perspective on life. And you also mentioned how running helped you, how exercise helped you when it comes to... Well, not then. Okay. Because the running came out of an experience that I had in 2010. So I had in 2009, 2010, I managed to get rid of the man in two th at the end of 2009. Again, a very painful experience. And in, in the, the space of about four weeks, I finished the relationship with the person that I came to Malta with. I st found a new home, started a new job, lost a job, and also had a horse riding accident, all in the space of these couple of weeks. And the horse riding accident was pretty serious. I had two brain hemorrhages and a ruptured spleen. And it was a, a you know, a kind of a very close call. And 
I moved out of that um, had been very grateful to be alive, but I also, about three or four months later, started experiencing we really weird stuff going on in my head, and it transpires that I had accident-related epilepsy. Now, I'm a bit stubborn, and because I, as part of my experience after um, the things that happened in London, I actually got hooked on antidepressants as well, when I was diagnosed with epilepsy, they said, OK, we're going to give you three tablets a day for the rest of your life. And I said, what does it do? It affects the serotonin in your brain. And I said, forget it. I'm not taking them. And I found a fantastic neurologist who worked with me on that. And he said, OK, you get auras, which are, are signs that they're coming. And so we will work together on that. And w for the time being, we won't take, you, you don't have to take medication. And at the same time, I was heading towards my 40s. And so I had decided that I wanted to run the London Marathon for my 40th birthday. And this gentleman who I just split up with had told everybody at a dinner party that I would never run the London Marathon because I had short legs like a pit pony. And so I decided, which I do have short legs, by the way. <laughs> Beautifully I'm nodding because short. I remember you, you <laughs> mentioning this on, in the event. And they're fine. I'm happy with my short legs. And I, I decided with a couple of friends that we all decided to, we'd just run the, the Malta Half Marathon, the Gozo Half Marathon. We decided we were going to apply uh, for the London Marathon. And I applied to run for the Epilepsy Society. And this story to this day always gets me emotional. I'm sort of trying to hold everything back. And they immediately accepted and said, yes, of course you can run for us. In actual fact, three epilepsy charities said you can run for us. And I was like, what the heck? And that marathon was on my birthday and I ran the London Marathon and I crossed the line and I was like, yes, you take your pit pony legs. And, you know, and here I am at 40 running the London Marathon. But I didn't know at the time that the side effects of running long distances had cured me from epilepsy. And it's one of those crazy medical things that uh, is just a phen you know, phenomenal for me. And it was, and I didn't, then after five years, I had, um, I had uh, the, the letter that said, you're cured, you've cured yourself of epilepsy, and which is without medical intervention, which was pretty stunning. So that's where the running comes into it. Originally started running because an ex-boyfriend told me I had pit pony legs. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> you can thank him now because it's ended up in such an amazing, well, you know, twice, I, <laughs> no, okay, we won't <laughs> thank him. <laughs> Not that gracious, Not that I can great. tell but you. But did give you the motivation to actually do it. Yes. And, and yeah, I mean, yeah. the result is, is amazing. It's, it's super, super inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're very welcome, <laughs> very welcome. Um, so as you said before, you're obviously, you've interviewed many, many, many people. Yeah. And the obvious question that comes to mind <laughs> is possibly maybe what has been the most challenging interview. And then on the other side, maybe what was maybe the most incredible interview, incredible experience. Well, first of all, I'll just tell you that I fell into interviewing. I am a graphic designer by trade. I graduated from university in 1997, and I went into the industry before there was even mobile phones, uh, uh, you know, digital phone, these sorts of things. There was definitely no internet when I... And I, I progressed all the way through, and I had an absolute spot of luck getting into television, radio, and eventually podcasting, because I happened to go in to see a client, uh, Clint Bayada, um, who'd just been appointed head of one radio, and he said, have you ever done radio, Trudy? And I said, well, I did it once at university. Do you want to do, do radio? So I became a guest DJ. So I started interviewing back in 2013, and my first guest was a, an international pop star, called Trevor Guthrie, who had just released a song called uh, This Is What It Feels Like, which was number one all over the world. And I just wrote to him on Facebook. I knew that he was playing as part of his tour. He's playing here in Malta. And I just wrote to him on Facebook and said, can I interview you? And he said, yes. So I, I, says, I would say that we, when we're still friends, we still keep in touch. And I would say that was probably just a benchmark moment for me because 
all the cra camera crews from yeah. all over the place were there. And I was like, what? And it kind of expected every interview to be like that afterwards. And that's not the case. Like a baptism of fire. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and he's incredibly nice to look at. So that wasn't too hard <laughs> either. Um, and I've been very fortunate. I've interviewed prime ministers, presidents, I, pop stars, all sorts. But the one interview that will stick in my mind forever, and I thought about this before I'm coming to see you, I had a series when I was a drive time DJ on XFM, I had a series with the Ministry of Families, Children's Rights and Social Solidarity. And this young lady, and I forgive me because I can't remember her name, she came to talk about adoption. And it was one of the first interviews in that series. And she was absolutely terrified. She came in and she was literally shaking. And that wasn't unusual because people quite often do. And it's why I love the job. Because you, it's not asking questions. It's about getting people on board and making them feel comfortable and making f them feel like they can answer questions. But she came in, into the studio terrified and I explained to her what was going to happen. And she talked about adoption and the value of adoption and how to go about adopting and the number of children in Malta who need homes and whether it be adopting or fostering. And by the end of that show, three listeners had called in or emailed in to say that they'd been thinking about it, but that she had made their mind up. So that show and that interview changed three young people's lives. And I always think that that is Powerful. bigger, yeah, yeah. much more powerful anything, yeah, yeah. than, you know, prime ministers yeah. and that sort of thing. I think yeah. that's... And possibly it may have been more than three. And, you know, they three were the ones who called, but the impact... Were the ones that got in touch, exactly. And I, and I hope that there's a, you know, for those young people, that there's a really positive story that came out of that. And, but it's always an interview that I remember just being very significant. There's been lots of interviews that have been amazing. In that part of that series, I also interviewed Michael Falzon, the minister. And, I, and this was one instance where I was getting nowhere. I couldn't <laughs> find, you know this, I couldn't find a point of contact with him. And so I, I, we were interviewing live on air and I turned around and I said to him, you know, which football team do you support? He said, not interested in football at all. I said, oh, Gosh, and you know when you just feel like you're dying. And I said, "What do you, in, what you know, what do you enjoy? What's your hobby?" And he said, "Fireworks." And boom, straight in there. And we had two segments talking about fireworks because I had so many questions: how do they make your heart shake and that sort of thing. So that was kind of one of those situations that, that was looked like it yeah. was going to be dead air, but came came good yeah. in the end. But that's you, obviously, your talent. Um, uh, in fact, I remember you on radio. Um, how many years were you? Just under four years. Just under four years. And on XFM and then yes. another three years on one radio before okay. that. And I mean, I remember the energy you had, you know, on radio was, was really positive and really exciting. And even this concept of like you had people, you know, on set, you were interviewing them, you know, throughout you know, throughout the, the program, which was quite interesting, I think. And it's not, it's not done very often. And I, I thought it was quite, quite good. And the fact that then you went on to launching the interviewer, the podcast, I think is, is, is amazing. You know, I follow it myself. And if you guys don't follow it, again, I tell you to follow it. Because <laughs> um, I mentioned it in another interview when I interviewed Tez and I told Well, I can't take credit for it. Okay. Um, I didn't want to leave radio. And Tez was my regular Friday co-host. And we had so much fun doing that. And to be honest with you, I was the only drive time DJ who was solo. And so I had to fill those three hours. So it became a kind of an easy way of filling the three hours with guests, because otherwise you sound a bit of an idiot. Um, and, <laughs> and then after we finished, Tez said to me, why don't you start doing podcasts? So she, she takes full okay. credit. There you go, Tez. Amazing. She takes full credit <laughs> for that. She's going to be happy. <laughs> I hope so. Cool. I remember listening to you both as well. You had this amazing energy together. And now you have every month, I believe you have, um, or every so often, you kind of have a spot on the podcast where you, where you kind of catch up. Yes, we do. Well, now there's two podcasts and one is women, just women. Yes. And, and the other one, and, and we as a team, I work with a, a, a jewellery brand on that. And that has been phenomenal to, to speak to just em empowering women and, and humbling very, very humbling. I mean, I think that's the thing about being an interviewer is you get to ask people questions and it's humbling. 
It is, it is. And it's also, from my end, um, it's also kind of satisfying, I said, and curiosity about people and wanting sort of to know more, to know the different sides to people as well. Because I believe that people have different sides, you know, maybe what we see out there at a glance is not, you know, it's not everything, you know, so people need to be humanized. And I think this is what's great about what you're doing, especially even, yes, I, I've listened to the, to the interviews you've done with the women. And if I may ask, is there maybe one particular interview there that maybe stood out that people should, should go for and listen to? I don't know if it's out at the okay. moment. I'll need to oh, yeah, check, can but I... Look I, out for it. I look out for it. When I think it's coming out um, towards the end of 2021, and it's a two-parter with... Helga Alul, okay. who tells the story of how she came to head up Playmobil in Malta. And I sat there, I mean, look, every interview, every interview is amazing. And every interview I've done in this Empowering Women series has been incredible as well. But this was jaw dropping because this woman really got the job because she was a f stood up for what she believed within her work environment. She was utterly respected. And then in 1974, they sent her in, in her beetle, her flowered covered beetle, to drive from Germany down to Malta to take over the operation here in Malta, to start the operation here in Malta. And just listening to this woman, she, she talks for the first hour about just her career. And I didn't even need to speak so empowering. I think there's so many stories yeah. that we don't know yeah. and so many stories and so many people that we have perceptions about and actually they're totally different. I agree, I agree 100% and even some, some episodes I've listened to that you've interviewed, I've, I've kind of found out different sides to people, you know, which was really nice. I've interviewed, you're interviewing me here at Gracie's and I've interviewed at Gracie's a good number of times because I've worked with Gracie's and right here in the room that we're in, I interviewed Baron de Rothschild uh, of the Rothschild legacy and wines and, and estates and you know this guy and he's an actual living breathing Baron and when I was asked to interview him I thought oh no he's going to be really stiff and it's going to be one he was the most laid back just energetic and warm individual. Well, again, one of those people that you have in your mind that you think is going to be one particular way. And not at all. He was brilliant. Brilliant fun. I think, well, this really proves the, the cliche, but you never judge a book by its cover, right? It's, it's really the case, you know, when you, when you interview people, it, it, you really bring across, like, listen, you know, don't judge people for what you think they are, because sometimes we project kind of our own you know, kind of our own um, perceptions on people, you know, so I think it's... But you know what I found through doing what has been my experience and my education, and I'm pretty sure it's, it's yours as well, but through the series of podcasting, I've interviewed people who I would have expected lots of people to want to listen to, and they haven't. And it's probably been because of perception. Some podcasts have had thousands of playthroughs and some of them have had who I would have thought would have been very successful haven't and, and it just comes down to public perception of that individual and every single time I've had to put my pub, my perception and my kind of my feelings about that person aside and say Trudy you do, actually don't know them you only know what the, the media says about them and they're totally different and, and really give you something of themselves. That's why I think that this culture of podcasts does need to grow more. The people do need to kind of give a chance, you know, to say, to listening to maybe things that they wouldn't be possibly inclined to listen to and give them a chance because I've done it. Like, and I think the podcasting culture, it will, it will grow. I listen to podcasts when I'm doing housework, for example, or I'm cooking, or I'm, sometimes even you if I'm driving. You can do my housework. <laughs> no, it's, it's <laughs> totally fine. Not a fan. <laughs> just has to be done. <laughs> Not a fan at all. But it's, it's just nice because, you know, you're kind of listening to something purposeful and valuable, you know. So but I think it will, it is growing slowly, Malton. I think it will, it will grow and it's good that obviously there, there are local podcasts that people can actually listen to. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, what, knowing what you know now, what advice maybe would you give yourself back possibly when you're 18, 19? Oh, wow. <laughs> 
I read a book, and this is, I'm really telling you something about myself, that a very dear friend gave to me, probably about three years ago, and it changed my life. She gave me a book, it's called um, Women Who Love Too Much, and, this, and the, the gist of the book is that as individuals, some of us give and give and give with the expectation of being loved in return. And that's not necessarily the case. And it really taught me to stop giving away myself in situations where I was never going to get what I was hoping for. And it was an absolute life changer. So if I could go back to the to the 18 year old me, I would give them that book. I don't know if think it was even written then, but let's say it was. And, and to really help that individual and uh, help them avoid, I don't know, 20 years of, of pain or 25 years of pain. Because I, I, and I know for a fact, because I talked about it um, through the podcast several times and I've, pub you know, I've put posts out about this book and women have contacted me and said, you know, where can I get it? What's it about? And so on and so forth. And I remember sitting down in the, the version that I had. I, my friend gave it to me and I sat it down to read it on a Ryanair flight to go to the UK. And I'd been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And the, the very first chapter and the very last chapter of the book talks about a woman, an individual called Trudy. And I've only met one Trudy in my life. And I, as I opened the book and I started reading it, I was like, is this a joke? You know, is this someone making this up for me? But it really did. And I think that is a message that I think for, for a lot of women, because a lot of women think if they give themselves, if they love to the point where they are really compromising themselves as, as individuals, they will get what they seek. It's not true at all. You have to be very choosy about where you share that love yeah. and give it and the energy you give as well yeah absolutely so it's also uh, and it's funny because I've, I've interviewed i'm very new at interviewing i'm <laughs> not even close to to where you are but what i see is common to people who have achieved success is this concept of kind of protecting your yourself you know your your kind of self-care you know which which not everyone kind of realizes it maybe in the beginning but when i ask them this question about the advice to give themselves is to kind of you know take care of of themselves and protect their energy and and choose you know where to kind of give their own their own energy and not kind of maybe self-sacrifice so much because i think as women especially but possibly also men we've kind of grown up to to have this concept of self-sacrifice oh let's do this for other people let's do everything for other people and in reality what i have learned as well is is the concept of you can't pour from an empty cup, right? So the, the more you kind of give to yourself, the more you can give to others. And the more you can give to others, the, the more kind of you, you're drained. And, and as you said, the more painful life is. So, But I found myself attracted to men and women who would never be able to give you what you're looking for and that was that that was the mental state that I had been taught that you have to keep pushing and keep giving and keep sacrificing because eventually they'll love you and that's not the case that's not the case if someone is a right idiot they're a right idiot it doesn't matter how much I'm be, I'm being very careful with my language here you know um, but uh, if someone is an idiot then it doesn't matter how much of your yourself that you give how much love you give they're never going to appreciate it and I think that's that would have saved me if I could have said that to myself at 18 years old that would have saved me from significant pain trauma abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, all of that that has scarred my life right up until that point. It's amazing because people watching, you know, if there are, um, you know, 18 year olds, 19 year olds watching who are so impressionable and do not have the experience that, that you have, I think it's so important to share these learnings, you know, and these insights because at the end of the day, it can help maybe someone else avoid, you know, um, going through certain painful experiences. Yeah, for sure. So um, do you have any hidden talents? Hidden talents, such as? Like knitting, I don't know, folding clothes, <laughs> I don't know. Do I look like someone who does <laughs> knitting? No, definitely. Um, I don't know, um, 
accents. I'm quite good at accents. Really? Yeah. Do you, have, do you know how to do Maltese accents? No, see, no, you can't ask me that. <laughs> the, 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 the Maltese accent is really difficult because I'm talking to somebody who's Maltese. And even oui, when yeah. I speak Maltese, which I do very badly, um, I'm usually corrected all the time. So I try to avoid anything that's Maltese. But um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why I, I did this, I've done this, but I pick up accents and I run with them. So I'm trying to think of a really easy, from the valleys. So my, it happens to be that my grandmother was Welsh. And I, I suppose that's why I then speak a little bit of Welsh like that. You see, I see. and that's that, that's I think accents is, and then you meet other people. I've once had a uh, drinking games with accent offs, so th I'm somebody else who can do accents, and we just kept going and and you know drinking shots until the till the game was finished. I think I don't actually remember the end of that, <laughs> but apart from that, I, I've got to say knitting and anything to do with housework and domestic, absolutely not. No, I did once. Um, I once entered the. British women's class of 600 cc motorbikes, and that year I came third. So I guess that could also be a talent. Driving as well. a motorbike, racing motorbikes, Amazing. a Brands Hatch. Yeah, that was, but that was a long time ago when I was much younger. Okay, and <laughs> foolish. Um, in terms of your career, um, if someone is looking into, you know, going into either radio or you know, interviewing, podcasting, maybe what what advice would you give them? Huh. I think I'm very fortunate because I got into it later in life. And maybe because my experience in media has been very different. Because I am not an Instagram generation. I'm, I've been around long, long, long before the internet. So all of those kind of influences didn't come to me. And Really, I can remember the first time I stood on stage to present, the first time I went on television to, to, to be a host of a show, and the first time I went on radio, and now the first time I've been interviewed. Um, it's absolutely terrifying, but only that first time. Um, I think if you're going to go into media, you have to, let's talk about media first, you have to remember that really what you look like is much less relevant than what you sound like and what you deliver. And that is particularly important in interview because as an interviewer, no one's gonna turn around and say, wow, that interview of, for instance, a recent one with Howard Keith, brilliant, he was a brilliant guest, he's a great guest. Trudy, you're a brilliant, brilliant interviewer. They're gonna focus on the guest and that's how it should be. The interviewer should be a facilitator only and be there to, to guide and bring out the, the best content from that person. But you have to have some self-sacrifice self on that because it's very rare that someone's going to come up and go, brilliant interview, you yeah. were brilliant. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. normally talk about the guest. So look, yeah. And that's how it that's should how be. That's how it should be. That is absolutely yeah. how it should yeah. be. But being able to have a TV show or a radio show or a podcast and make it all about somebody else and always about someone else that is probably the biggest okay. lesson. And talking about, because you mentioned social media, yeah. and you mentioned that you're not, <laughs> you seem to not be a big fan of social media. So no, 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 uh, no, no, no. I'm not. It's not that I'm a, not a big fan. Mm -hmm. I am not of that generation. Mm -hmm. We mentioned Tez, whom I love dearly. She is Insta queen. She knows what she's doing. She's you know all over the shop. I tend to be much too personal and only do it when I can be bothered. Yeah, yeah, okay. So is it something that you feel that social media is something that maybe there's a negative effect on people? Like do you have this, what's your perception on social media? Not, not maybe you using it, but in general, like do you think it has its positives? I'm gonna use uh, quotes from people that I've interviewed and interviewed recently and particularly young women. Um, I had a recent interview with Karen Duff who is a, who's a you know, social media queen. She's amazing. She's stunning. She <laughs> talked about the, the pressure of being in the media. Amber talked about the pressure of being in the I media. Heard that. I listened to you know, And I talked also to Island Mama, um, Melissa Gatt, who talked about the fact that she's in the media mm -hmm. 
Um, but she picks and chooses what she does. I think there's a lot of women out there, and I'm talking specifically about women, who are leading the way in telling the truth. But let's face it, we don't see reality on social media. Probably on my feeds you would, because <laughs> I'm too old to work out what these filter things are. I'm like, okay. But still, I think it's also, it's also highlights of, of our lives that we share generally, you know? So, yes. so it is the case that sort of you see, okay, they're having a great day, but maybe the day before they didn't, and they didn't post about that. Exactly. In fact, I had this conversation with Tez in the interview as well. Yeah. She's also very passionate about it, and I myself am quite passionate about it. Um, she pulled that out in an interview that I had mm -hmm. with her, and that was an incredibly powerful I mentioned interview. it to her, and we spoke yeah. about it. Yeah, and it wasn't intended, and it was just because mm -hmm. Tez and I have such a close relationship in that re regard. And I think that, I mean, I'm very blessed. I had this conversation uh, with Sarah Zarafa years ago, and I mentioned the fact that I, I started my career before there was even the internet. And she said, you mean before Instagram? And I said, no, before there was the internet. So I probably have a different perspective. I didn't grow up with this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see that it's a useful tool, mm -hmm. and I see that it has a commercial and personal function. Yeah. But, the com but let's not forget that Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Facebook are powerful money tools. Mm -hmm. They are not here to make our lives better. They are here to make money and we are facilitating that. And I think it's really important to remember that mm -hmm. whilst we enjoy it, yeah. the algorithms are specifically designed to make money, yes. not to make us feel better. In fact, um, one thing that I see and I know obviously um, that the more controversial, the more clickbaited, the more sensationalists are, the more that organically go viral because people comment because they're angry. And as you're saying, the algorithm favors um, posts that are commented on and possibly maybe content like this, which is maybe more inspiring, empowering and maybe more positive and less controversial, may not get the same viral organic reach that then sensationalist content does. And that is where I think, I believe I agree with you, the, the problem lies because there isn't a balance, you know, because obviously people tend to comment when they feel angry and, yeah. and they fall into a bit of a trap, right? And I, yeah. I think this is something that you discussed, I listened to Ben Kamel, uh, media literacy. And he mentioned media literacy for, yeah. for children and for people growing up because people do not, some people do not know this, that maybe some, you know, content out there is there just to spur you off and just for you yes. to comment and, you know, for you to kind of comment and bring their content up, you know. So, so I think it's a, it's an important subject to talk about, and and as you said, however, there is there are positives to social media. I mean, I'm listen. I'm not. I didn't grow up with Instagram as well. So I, I <laughs> <laughs> um, so but I am. Um, I kind of made my. I, I kind of like social media to a certain extent, but also don't like it. I have a love hate relationship, um, but I really like what you said when it comes to you know knowing that. Listen, this is not. Social media is not there to kind of do us any favors, you know. We no, and it, it's just worth remembering. Yes. It's very important to remember that all of this, whether it, you know, even um, TikTok and, and mm -hmm. all of them mm -hmm. are not there to make you feel good. Mm -hmm. They're there to make money. Yeah. And to have that kind of skepticism means that you can appreciate it for what it is. Yeah. Mo mobile phone producers, you know, and all the apps that go with them are not there to make you feel good necessarily. They are there first and foremost to make money. And I think that's just a perspective that we have to keep in mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. so it's a filter we have to put kind of listen, like, okay, this is the way we consume content. Yeah, Very exactly. good point. <laughs> so what have you enjoyed the most so far in your journey? You've had quite a multifaceted experience, you know, radio, podcasting, TV, presenting, uh, presenting at events. What's, what kind of lights you up the most? Well, well, I would definitely say that all of my experiences led me to, to have a love to interview. Simply because every single time you speak to somebody, there's a challenge to connect and to connect quickly and to make that person feel comfortable enough that they're going to share their story. And you don't want a story that somebody else has already heard. So I am fascinated by people, and I'm fascinated by learning things that I haven't known or I didn't know, or 
you know, experiences that I have no possible way of having myself, having had myself, but to be able to to live that through somebody else's story, that that is definitely without a shadow of doubt where I arrived to. I think when I was doing live radio, uh, I think uh, that was an incredible journey as well. Being on the back of the bus was quite fun because people would message and tell you they've just seen you on the back of a bus. And, and that was always quite fun. But at being engaged with people with, you know, you'd, you, throughout the course of the show, you'd get, you know, 30, 40 people contact you and, and tell you what the traffic is happening. If there's been an accident, you're probably likely to have about 100 people contact you in the space of half an hour. And you know that your role is, to, again, it's not about you. It's only to make that 15 minutes that that person is sitting in traffic bearable for it's them. work for me, that's for sure. Like, oh, bless traffic, you! For sure, for sure, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and having that engagement and being able to do that and, and finding something that you're good at. Mm -hmm. But I would definitely say through all of that journey from the TV, TV is great, TV is awesome, um, radio, brilliant, but meeting people, engaging people, you know, standing on stage, presenting Farson's Beer Festival. All of these are incredible experiences, but actually meeting people and engaging and finding out what their story is. The intimate conversation. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the best, I think. And my last question, uh, yeah. what's next for Trudy? What can we expect? Wow, well, Look, I have to, again, blame Tez for this because she got me into this bother of podcasting in the first place. Once we get to the end of the first year, there will be some changes to the podcasting setup. Uh, you know, it's going to get a little bit more exciting, a little bit more of engagement, and probably, hopefully, looking at broadening horizons as well to interview interviewing um, people not just within these shores, but looking further afield. And I hope that's going to happen because, again, that's, that's something I really want to concentrate on. So we'll see. I'm not going to give too much away because... <laughs> that would be amazing. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Looking forward to but, it. But really just, I'd like to take this passion as far as I could possibly take it before I draw a pension. Wish you the very, very best of luck. Thank you. thank you so much for being our guest here. And thank you to you guys for watching and we'll see you next week on the next episode.